Amen. All right, grab your Bibles this morning and uh, we'll get into the Word. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven, an important little passage, a uh, uh, little text here as he moves from the introduction of the sermon, which was the Beatitudes, into maybe more of the the meat of what he's going to get to. But we have to do our diligence and uh, really understand this transition portion here and and get what he is is uh, uh, trying to say. And I'll tell you right now, I I struggled a little bit with this and how to consolidate it because even though it's a short passage of scripture, he's he's battling a couple of different um, false teachings and trying to present the balanced teaching. And so that is what we're going to endeavor to do here today. Let's pray once again. Father, thank you again for your word. Bless now as we endeavor to preach it. I pray that you would give me clarity to speak. Give us all attention uh, to tune into your word and apply it to our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So at this point in Jesus's ministry, it's very early on, but he is already aware that there is a collision coming between him and the Pharisees. I mean, it's going to uh, come to a head very soon because they were considered to be the experts in the law. They, everybody looked up to them. They had positioned themselves. They enjoyed the power that came with being considered the authorities on the law and uh, the, the Old Testament and the prophets and all of this. But here, seemingly out of nowhere, comes Jesus of Nazareth. He has not come through their schools of learning. He has not been trained by their rabbis. He is an outsider, right? We we heard a lot uh, in this last political election cycle about outsiders and some of the popularity of that. Well, Jesus was one of those outsiders. He was not a part of the, the political or religious system of Jerusalem, but his popularity was just through the roof. He, he was having crowds come. The end of uh, chapter 4 talked about just multitudes uh, coming, partly because he's doing these miracles. He's healing people. I mean, just doing things people have never seen before. But it was beyond what he was doing. It was also what he was saying. Because his message was different from anything that they had heard from any of the scribes and the Pharisees and, and all of that. And, you know, the Pharisees, they had never had crowds like that. I mean, their teaching was very dry, Uh, cold, dead exposition of laws upon laws upon laws. And uh, they they were uh, all about traditions. And Jesus was not about that. He He didn't emphasize keeping all of their traditions. In fact, he went out of his way sometimes to spurn their traditions. It seems like if you look at a lot of the healing miracles and things that Jesus did, it's almost like he on purpose picked the Sabbath day to do it. You know, he just... Uh, went out of his way to show how ridiculous that all of their traditions had become. That when they would go to eat, they weren't all interested in all of the ceremonial washings and stuff that the Pharisees were all about. He sat down. He kept company with sinners and publicans and ate with them and uh, touched lepers and all of these things. He was very different as a religious teacher. 
and his message was different from anything that people had heard before. And, and rather than this continual emphasis on keeping of the law, his teachings were often centered on themes of grace and love and uh, love for God and love for fellow man and so on. And so all of this popularity... And the way that he was speaking and, and acting among the people, it provoked great envy in the other religious leaders. They did not like to see him uh, pulling their, their people and those that they were trying to teach. And so the Lord knows, uh, obviously he knows all things. He knows that the lines are already being drawn. It's not going to come to a head for a while, but already the war has begun in a way. And not a war of weapons at first, but definitely a war of words and of ideas had already started. And so in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus has pulled away from the multitudes now. And he has, when he was set, verse 1 of chapter 5 uh, says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. So he's pulled away from the multitudes. He's teaching his disciples his ways to prepare them for what is ahead. And he's taught them all through the Beatitudes. We've worked our way through those. Ta teaching essentially this, that who you are is more important than what you do. Because who you are determines what you do, doesn't it? It, it, it? it should flow out of that. And he knows that all of these accusations are about to come. That they're going to say, this Jesus, he's here to preach a message contrary to the law. Contrary to the prophets, he would rather take the Old Testament, all of the scriptures, and tear them up and start something brand new. Throw them all away. He thinks he's better than Moses and the prophets. Well, we do know that he is better. We've been talking in uh, Hebrews about how that he is better than Moses, and he is better than the prophets. He's better than Aaron the high priest. He's even better than the angels, amen? He is the son of God. But, but they misunderstood, uh, as they heard his message of grace, and they saw how different it was from the way they understood and practiced the Old Testament law, the Lord knew that they were going to misunderstand him, misunderstand his intentions. And so he tells his disciples right up front in verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill Matter of fact, you can't destroy the Old Testament. You can't do it. It is the inspired and preserved word of God. Look at verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And so every promise that God ever made in the Old Testament must come to pass. It must happen. Every prophecy will will happen just the way he said they would it, in fact it would be easier to destroy the heaven and the earth than to do away with the word of god it can't be done um, we we live in kind of a, an era an age where even christian people lack a basic confidence in the authority of the word of god and so isn't it refreshing to see right from the lips of Jesus how he just lifts it up and he exalts it. And his confidence isn't just in like the concepts that, you know, sometimes you hear it contains truth or the Bible uh, contains the word of God. You know, it is not about the concepts. He, he looks to the very words and even the parts of the words, the letters and down to the very, he says, the jot and the tittle. Okay, the jot is is like the, uh, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's called Yod, and uh, it's about the size of an apostrophe. And Jesus said, that little letter, that's important. In, in God's scheme, that is part of God's word. And then the, the tittle, it's even less than that. It's just a part of a letter, like the seraph or a, a little, um, if you had a line going down, that might look like a small L. If you put a little cross on it, it suddenly becomes a whole different letter. It's a T. Or if you've got a round letter, what's that, kids? And oh, very good, smart. All right. And you put a little line down in there, what's it become? A Q. Totally different letter, right? But just a little portion of it. Jesus said those little pieces of the letters that God has, has preserved, those are important. And it's going to come to pass just like he said it would. 
That's the level of detail and the perfection that God has put into his word. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, some have tried, of course, to destroy the Bible. Satan has cast doubt upon it from the very beginning. There are people through history like or Origen of Alexandria and, and others who have tried to take it upon themselves to tweak it, to change it, which is why we have so much confusion today in different Bible versions and Bible translations and so on. Uh, but you look down through and Stalin, Stalin banned Bibles and Hitler burned Bibles and philosophers like Nietzsche said, we're going to get rid of all of the Bibles. But all those unbelievers have come and gone. And guess what's still here? The word of God. Down to the jot and tittle, it still remains. So, so Jesus is saying, I have no interest in destroying the scriptures. The law, the prophets, all of that. No, no, no. I am here to fulfill it. But what's he mean by that? Does he mean he's going to complete it and close the book and thereby do away with any further need for it? Because there are a lot, uh, uh, there's a big philosophy out there in Christianity that would say it's all about the New Testament. You know, all we need is uh, the gospel and you can basically, now that you, we're in the New Testament age and under grace, you could just basically... Do, you could live and do without the Old Testament. That Jesus came and they say, fulfill the law and it doesn't apply anymore. We are under grace, not law. Some of that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And so we have to grapple with some of this and understand what he's meaning. Um, and I know that certain things have changed, obviously, from old to new. That, that, that cross, that changed a lot of things, didn't it? When he came up out of the grave, that changed a lot of things of God's redemptive plan for the ages. But, but you look at the whole of Scripture, it really is one unified message. It is all about God's love and redemption of mankind from sin. You know, Jesus, we're not, I'm not going to have you turn to all these verses, but I want to say them for you and tr just try to tune into them. But John 5, 39, Jesus told the, uh, the disciples and, and others, uh, the Pharisees even, he said, search the Scriptures. What's he talking about? The Old Testament. That was the only scriptures they had at that point, the law and the prophets. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So why would he want to destroy that which testified of him, right? He wouldn't. Uh, Luke 24, 44, the Lord says, All things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Christ. It's all about him. Uh, and so we're not going to, uh, we're gonna, we do live under grace in this New Testament age, and that does need to factor in in our understanding of the scriptures. But it's not like we're just going to rip out the Old Testament and toss it to the side and say, well, we don't need that anymore. That was just for the Hebrews. That was just back then. No, quite the opposite. Paul, Paul wrote in uh, Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. 1 Corinthians 10 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them, for in samples, they are written for our admonition. We need the Old Testament, amen? We need that. It, it helps our understanding. So what does it mean that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets? If it doesn't mean he rendered them complete, obsolete, finished, what does it mean? I believe it means that he came to keep them to the full. To keep, to be perfectly obedient in every way. He's saying, I'm not here to do away with all the commandments or the law. I'm here to perform them and to do so perfectly. You, you realize Jesus never once broke a commandment of God. Never. He broke some of those traditions, but never the scriptures. In fact, they had to resort to deceit to condemn him to death. Because all Jesus did, the Bible says, was he went about doing good. Even Pilate, this unbeliever Gentile, he looks at Jesus, hears the testimonies, hears the witnesses. He's like, I find no fault in this man. No fault. And that is exactly who Jesus was. Uh, he, never, he was perfectly righteous before the law of God and even the law of man. The Old Testament law set the standard for righteousness. And it, it's high, folks. It's really high. It was a standard that no one could ever measure up to. None of us. Some might do a little better than others along the way, but we all fall short. 
All, all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To sin, in fact, means to miss the mark. We, we can't hit that perfect target. But when Jesus came, you could set him up against the measure of the law, and, and he measured up perfectly, fully. He fulfilled it perfectly. He fulfilled it, and above and beyond, not just obeying the letter of the law, but even the, encompassing the whole spirit in which the law was given. He, and then he goes on to, to teach his disciples here that he expected them, his disciples, those who wanted to be his followers, he expected them to obey the commands of God as well. Look at verse 19. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And that's really what Matthew is about, is presenting Jesus as king. This is talking about his kingdom where he will rule and reign upon the earth. And so he's been teaching them, here's what it means to be a part of my kingdom. Here's what it's going to look like. It's not going to operate like the kingdoms of this world operate, the way that people grapple for power and, and people are prideful and arrogant and, and overzealous and, and they stand up and fight for what they want in this world. No, no, no. He said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. It's talking about their sin, mourning over sinfulness and, and realizing how bankrupt we are spiritually. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth and, and, and to hunger. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But what is righteousness? What does it mean to be righteous? Well, essentially it means to be right. To be right with God. To, to be righteous means to measure up to the standard that God has set. Um, but the problem is we can't fulfill the law. We all fall short. No one can measure up. I mean, the scribes and the Pharisees, they are the religious elite, right? They have dedicated their lives to understanding and keeping the law down to the, the letter but look what Jesus says in verse 20. Pretty incredible statement here. He says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the reason for that is that the, the Pharisees looked good on the outside, but they still didn't measure up on the inside. They... Remember, the Lord has been emphasizing that his kingdom is about the heart. It's about within. Um, it, it's more than just what you do. It's about obeying from the heart and who you are before God on the inside. If you were to call somebody, be called a Pharisee today, if somebody says, you Pharisee, that's not a compliment, is it? <laughs> it's synonymous with hypocrite. You hypocrite. And that's what they were uh, and, and people get mixed ideas about what a hypocrite is, too. A hypocrite is not somebody who believes this uh, but doesn't quite measure up. I think that would be all of us, wouldn't it be? We all believe in the ideal of oh, perfect obedience, but none of us is perfect, right? That's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is where you are portraying on the outside something you are not on the inside. You're being a pretender. You're putting on a mask. And that is what they were doing. They, they looked righteous but they were not righteous. Jesus called them once whited sepulchers. You're all painted up and pretty on the outside, but on the inside, it's just hollowed out and full of dead men's bones. Quite an indictment, right? Uh, their faith, it was just a cold, dead form of legalism. And, and so they went to all these pains, they took all these pains to be obedient externally where people could see their obedience but where it was private on the inside, they, they did it with no heart for God. Because their obedience in the end was not driven by a love for the Lord at all. It was not for his glory. It was so that they could be seen of other people as being righteous. It was for their glory. It was for people to see them. And, and so their obedience, quote unquote, to the law 
was so far removed from these beatitudes we've been studying, from this, this program that God says, Jesus says is my kingdom. They, they were not humble. They were not mournful over their sins. They're all puffed up in pride. They're saying, look at my righteousness. Look how good I am. And everything about their religion was contrary to the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus tells his disciples, you don't hunger after that kind of righteousness. You need to have a righteousness that exceeds that. The Pharisees, what they're doing, that's not even a part of my kingdom. You know, I was, I was struck by the statistics of all of the, the atheism and stuff in China, and I've heard that before, but I was reminded of it this morning. What would it say? 5% claim any kind of religious affiliation at all? 5%? That's incredible. Um, and I know that atheism is on the rise here in America as well. If you follow the polls and stuff, the fastest growing religious group in America, it is not Baptist, it is not uh, Catholic or uh, Methodist or anything like that. It is not even evangelical or Muslim, okay? The fastest growing group in America is called the nuns, okay? Identify with none of these. Uh, and that is, that is on the rise. And of course... Um, people like that, they need, they need to be told, told the gospel because Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. Amen? But I'm telling you, there are millions of people just like these scribes and Pharisees who are good, religious people who are not saved and, and who are so far removed from the kingdom of God because they are satisfied in their own self-righteousness, but they are not headed to heaven. People try, do their best to try to lift up good works, uh, to try to make their best efforts to keep the law, and they think that somehow because they have the, the sincere intentions that that's going to be enough. But I'm telling you, we all fall short. Everybody falls short of the glory of God. And so Jesus says, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to just step it up and try to beat the Pharisees at their own game? You know, the, the Pharisees, they, they fast twice in the week. So I'm telling you what, I'm going to fast five times this week. All right? The, the Pharisees pray an hour a day. I'll pray for three. All right? They, they can only walk 500 steps on the Sabbath. I'll tell you what, I'm not even getting off the couch. <laughs> Beat that, right? Uh, you see, that, that's not how we exceed the, the righteousness of the Pharisees because that's the same type. It's still a self-righteousness. It's still like, ah, well, you're me. I'm getting it done. I, I'm being righteous, and I'm more righteous than the other person is. That is not what he's talking about. Turn to Titus, the book of Titus. It, see, it doesn't matter how good we are. It, it's never, ever good enough. It's just not. You'll never find that point where you say, all right, I've arrived. Because salvation, it's not dependent upon how often you pray or how much you give, or how faithful of a church member that you are. You can't look back and say, well, I was baptized, I did this. I mean, I was baptized five times, you know. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many times you've taken communion or any of those things. Uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So the only one, the only one who has ever fully measured up, who has fulfilled the law and the prophets is Jesus Christ. He alone is righteous. And in salvation, what happens isn't that you start here and you get better and better and better and better and better until maybe someday you measure up. No, it is that in poverty of spirit, you recognize how bankrupt you are. And you say, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying anymore. I'm giving up my works because I am not righteous. Only Christ is righteous. You give up those efforts. You accept his rightness before God as a free gift because his grace and his righteousness is the only kind that can exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. So, that's part one. 
<laughs> We've got to shift gears here. And uh, I wanted that to be smoother than it was, but we'll just make it a sh rough shift here. At this point, we've got to be cautious we don't take this logic too far the other direction. Because sometimes people will take it this way. We're saved by become, being partakers of the righteousness of Christ. True? Yes. I have been made righteous in him and my sin is covered, but it's washed away by his grace. Amen? Amen. That's right. So, I don't have to try to do right anymore. I don't have to obey the commandments of the Bible because it's all under grace. You see, bad step in logic right there. And, and then what happens is that the grace of God that we have received from him gets treated like this get out of hell free card where you can just live however you want. And hey, I got my card. I'm good. I got grace. You know, and, and so they think maybe now it, it doesn't matter. I, I'm justified. I'm covered by grace. So I can sin. I can live it up. I don't have to worry about actually living a righteous life. I am righteous in him. Nothing can change that. Well, I understand what you're saying there. That yes, we are justified in him alone, and it's not based on our personal righteousness or our good works. Those who are in heaven, I, I just want to be clear. That's what Jesus was doing here. I just want to be clear, right? Just clarify a few things. Those who are in heaven will all be there by the grace of God. Those who are righteous in God are all righteous because of Christ. All. But ultimately, in Matthew 5, this is what I had to remember. We're not really talking about salvation here. He's talking to his disciples. They are saved. They are followers. And he's teaching them what he expects of those who want to be his disciples. So while you're in Titus, I want you to see this. We've just established quite clearly that we are not saved by the works of righteousness, which we have done. Amen? You following? Oh, boy, I hope I haven't lost you yet because we've got a little work to do here. Uh, <laughs> I am so sorry. I, I tried and I tried to, to boil this down more and uh, I, it, just, it, it just didn't happen. And so you're going to have to just put in a little extra labor here this morning. I hope you're okay with that. So we are not saved by the righteousness which we have done. We're justified by grace. But look what happens in verse 8. Titus 3, 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So you're not saved by good works, but if you're saved by grace, you should still be careful to maintain good works. Back up to chapter 2 in verse uh, 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Good works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we often quote them here. Favorites, right? For by grace... Are you saved? Through faith. And then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But then the next verse, verse 10, says, For we are his workmanship, uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So he couldn't be more clear. We are not saved by our good works, but we are saved unto good works, a life of work, good works. We are made righteous in Christ so that we can live righteously in this world. Turn back to Matthew 5. So where we could never fulfill the demands of the law, Christ did. But that doesn't mean we don't have to keep it now. Grace doesn't give us this excuse that says, well, I'm just a sinner, so why even try? be righteous. I, I'm righteous in him, so I can, I can just do what I want. No, I'm righteous in him so that I can live for him. And the way we obey now isn't that we are forced by the law and so on. Since we've been born again, he puts within us a new heart, a new nature, a new want to, 
to walk on, on this narrow path and not try to find all the loopholes or whatever. It's a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees because it's not just an external legalism. It's a righteousness that is inside and out, and what's in our hearts then comes out through good works that we live. So here's the point. Jesus never removed the demands of the law for either himself or for his disciples. In fact, what, God, what Jesus does is he says, okay, this is the standard before, I'm going to raise it. He raised the bar beyond what it was before, but he also did this, picked us up by his grace and enables us to keep it. I love going to the park with the kids and uh, some parks you can still find like the, the monkey bars, you know, you can swing like a monkey from one to the next to the next and uh, there's like six feet of uh, soft rubber now everywhere so nobody gets hurt. But you go on the monkey bars and you know, uh, Cameron might swing and Ray Lynn, she is a monkey so she swings. She's not amused. <laughs> she likes to swing. And then Maddie's like, oh. I want to do it, she, but she's not tall enough. She's not big enough. She can't do it. So what do I do? Scoop her up, pick her up, and all of a sudden, she's up there. So Jesus Christ, by his grace, he, he enables us to attain a level of righteousness that is beyond that that could never be attained by the scribes and Pharisees. Isn't that incredible? Unreal. Now, I understand that things are different in this day and age. There are elements of the law that are obsolete in Christ. You think of the, the, the law, it's kind of in three forms. I'm not going to go off on this tangent, but there's the moral law, there's the civil law that was just for Israel during that time in history. It was their na nation's laws. And then there was the ceremonial law, all the sacrifices and the temple and all that. Well, when Jesus died, what happened in the temple? The veil, right, was torn. That was God saying, that portion of the law, it's done. It's fulfilled into Christ. The book has been closed on that. And that's what Hebrews is all about. Okay, So this is a good balance for us, for the book of Hebrews, as we're studying it, because we've been saying, hey, the New Testament's better than the Old Testament. And he has uh, finished the, the old and established the new. Well, that's the ceremonial law that, that he has, has done away with. But the moral law is timeless. The moral law of God has never changed. The penalties may be different, but what was morally right back then, it's still right today. What was morally wrong in the Old Testament, it's still wrong. Jesus never did away with those commandments of righteousness in the law. Those who want to, uh, you know, maybe get ahead in this world, they will, they will find ways to bend or to break God's commands, kind of get around things. But Jesus said, no, 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 that's not how you become great in my kingdom. You know who's great in my kingdom? The end of verse 20 or uh, verse 19, whosoever shall do and teach them, the law and the prophets, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So the point of the New Testament, being under the New Testament in this age of grace, it is not that we are somehow released from obeying God's commandments. Under grace, we're held to an even higher standard than that which was under the law. He has raised the bar even higher. And I'm trying to make a point of this because that explains everything that we're about to get into in the Sermon on the Mount. And you're like, well, I'm just here for today. Well, sorry. Enjoy it. Eat up. <laughs> right? This would be a good study for you. But, but we're going to get into some other applications of it where they, they looked at the law and said, thou shalt not murder. Right? But as long as I can resist taking a club and bludgeoning him to death, I'm still righteous. <laughs> I've done right. Right up to the line, but as long as I don't actually kill him, I've obeyed the commandments. That's a very low standard of righteousness, wouldn't you say? So Jesus lifts the bar. He says, you don't even harbor hatred in your heart toward that person. They, they would say, thou shalt not commit adultery, but, but hey, I can get as close as I can to it. As long as I don't actually commit adultery, I'm still okay. Jesus said, no, you got lust in your heart. Follow the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. You see, he took a very high, impossible standard, and he raised it. He brought it to new, dizzying, <laughs> impossible heights outside of his grace. It's sad. It's sad when Christians live legalistically, like the Pharisees, where they're always 
pushing the lines. Life becomes all about the rules. How far can I go in this direction? Where's the edge here? How, how close can I get? Looking for loopholes and stuff. That's sad because that's not how the Christian life is supposed to be lived. But it, that's just one side. And some people say, oh, I'm so far away from that. I'm way over here. Well, you know, there's a saying that there's a ditch on both sides of the road. And so there's the legalism ditch, but then over here is like, I'm so far away from that, I live however I want to live because I'm under grace. That's another ditch, and it's no better. That's also sad. Where grace becomes some kind of license to sin. 2 Peter 2.19 says, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. And so here's Christ teaching this perfect balance between the two. Of, of perfect liberty, of, of perfect discipleship. And so righteousness is not found in getting rid of the law, but in obeying the law from the heart. By the grace that we have received in Christ, he raises the bar. And so this morning, I guess I'll wrap it up here. This morning, if you are not saved, you need to understand that what we've talked about, that your good works and your best efforts and all of your self-righteousness will never be enough. You cannot in a thousand lifetimes do enough good works to earn salvation. It can't be done. It is only to be received as a free gift in humility and poverty of spirit. And you need to receive that. But if you are saved this morning, understand that we have not been somehow released from obedience to the commands of the Bible. We have actually been called to a higher obedience than ever before. An obedience that flows not from a fear of the law, but from a love for the Lord. The disciples of Christ, and if you claim to be one, if you say, I'm a Christian, and I'm not, I don't want to just be some nominal Christian, a Christian name only. I want to be Christ's follower. I want to walk in his steps. I want to live the life that he has for me. The disciples of Christ ought to be the most righteous and holy people on the planet. Because he has given us that grace and a heart that hopefully is zealous unto good works. So how are you doing, Christians? How's your obedience? How's your obedience? Have you given up because you say, well, well, I'm just a sinner. And you're abusing the grace that's been given to you. Don't do that. Have you gotten a little pharisaical? Doing all the right things where it's visible to others because I'm maintaining my testimony. But on the inside or in private times, you're terribly unrighteous. That is not the life of the disciple. We ought to be fulfilling the law of God and living these holy, righteous lives to the glory of God because we love him. And if you're looking for an easy Christianity, an easy path that doesn't require all this hard work and discipline, we haven't gotten there yet, but I want to encourage you, just go find that broad way that most people end up on. Because what he's talking about here, the life of a disciple, is not that path. It's a life of righteousness. It is straight, and it is narrow, and it requires living every day by the grace of God, through a power that's beyond even yourself. Now, I am not here today to make you feel guilty. Like, oh, man, we're all wicked heathen here, you know. Uh, I understand. We all need the grace of God in our lives. I'm not here to make you feel guilty because guilt is a very poor motivator. I'm here to deliver to you the words of Christ and hopefully cause you to fall more deeply in love with him to where he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's a higher level of obedience. Follow in his steps. Let's not be the kind of Christians who will do just enough to get by. We must beg God to produce within us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that never lets up, a zeal for living, a life of obedience and good works that is right in the sight of God. Jesus did not come and do away with all the commandments of the Old Testament. He raised the bar. But praise God, he also gave us the grace that we can fulfill it. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time.